the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and I'm delighted to be here with Annegret Fauser, who is a professor of music and a musicologist at the university. And we're going to talk about her work and why she became a musicologist and her vision for the magazine that she's editing now. So my first question is, uh, what did you find that was so unique about the composers of World War II? Well, for me, what was one of the most fascinating things to look at music during World War II was that a war, a world war, in the United States could actually bring forth to such a degree interest and focus on classical music, not even just entertainment, but music like uh, Fanfare of the Common Man by Copeland and other such works. The government spent huge amounts of money, never before there was so much governmental support for classical music. Um, government agencies were basically supporting classical music. It was one of the amazing and astonishing things during a war that had you know, battalions out there fighting each other in the mud in, in the South Pacific. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that World War II was a cultural war where you had the Axis powers and the Allied powers fighting not only sort of who was the stronger military power, but also who was really dominating world culture. And during World War II, the idea was still that so-called high culture is where it was all about. And uh, therefore, to look at classical music is for me not only to learn about a conflict, but also to learn about value systems, to learn about why music mattered. One really interesting uh, case for me would be Mark Blitzstein, who volunteered as a special services officer for the 8th Air Force, uh, was stationed in London, and then managed to get himself a year off where his only duty was to write a symphony that was dedicated to the Air Force and that would become his Airborne Symphony. The idea today that a soldier would be, you know, just freed in Afghanistan to write a symphony seems quite ludicrous, but this was part of the idea to fight and show that American culture was equal if not superior to what happened in Europe. There was the idea that with the outbreak of fascism and Nazism culture had fled. Culture was no longer at home in these okay. countries and the place where it went was in effect the US. And so you would have uh, journalists writing about Beethoven and say, well, Beethoven, if he were living today in Germany, he would be in concentration camp because Beethoven is a freedom ca uh, fighter. And instead, now, Beethoven would actually be in America, and in his heart, Beethoven was an American composer. And that's a really good way of bringing Beethoven over to the U.S. That's fascinating. It was an opportunity to broaden the appeal of classical music, but also for classical music to pay, play an important role in American culture. Today, we can't imagine that classical music would play such a role. I mean, we, we hear record companies worrying about their their consumers, whereas during the war, uh, radios, for example, would dedicate uh, big chunks of their time to classical music. One of the major features during the, I mean, before and during the war, was the broadcast of the Metropolitan Opera on Saturday afternoons. That was having an audience of 17 million listeners. Um, the NBC Symphony with Toscanini would have millions of people listening and I have letters from soldiers who were abroad who said you know we managed to get the NBC in and we managed to listen to Beethoven performed with Toscanini and it was a moment of reflection and magic and you know a moment of peace in all that horror that we are in there and this is not sort of something that was prompted it was the letter by Oscar Hammerstein's son oh. Bill to his father so it was a private letter. That's fascinating. Well, how did you get started in musicology, or why did you choose musicology? Musicology is the field in which I can combine the two things I like most. History on the one hand, I'm really interested in how things came to happen, and music, because I honestly just love music. And musicology allows me to find out why these pieces have come to be, what they mean, how they have changed their meaning over time. Let me give you an example. Yankee Doodle is a tune that we associate with America and a kind of brash, confident American.
Well, a musicologist would learn when she did research that in effect, when it started out, Yankee Doodle was a tune used by the Brits in the Revolutionary War to mock Americans yeah. as uncultured, macaronic people. But like it happens often, it was picked up by the American revolutionaries and taken as a badge of pride. And by the end of the war, uh, when in effect you had the big surrender at Yorktown, apparently the British were playing The World is Upside Down and the Americans were playing Yankee Doodle. And ever since, Yankee Doodle stands really for, hey, we are American and we won. <laughs> and so you have it in the 19th century, it becomes this big tune. Uh, in World War I, it becomes another tune that it gets used again. And even in, in, in World War II, you have Yankee Doodle Dandy, the film with Paul Cagney, that sort of is all about, hey, we won. Even the Voice of America used Yankee Doodle to say, hey, here is some good news. You're the new editor of the Journal of the American Musicological Society. What's your vision for the journal? Given that that's the journal for ideally all musicologists, not just in the US, but English reading musicologists, I would like it to be even broader than it is now. And I would like to publish shorter articles that could speak to anyone who is interested either, say, in medieval music or pulp fiction or anything in between.